Okay. Good evening. My name is Kaylee Thomas. I'm the assistant director here at the Blue Hill Public Library. And tonight we're very happy to be co sponsoring this program with the Blue Hill Historical Society. And we have tonight with us, we have Rainy Bach. Is that Bench? Ben? Like you said, on. Okay. Oh, Bench. Okay. Bench. All right. <laughs> All right. Of the Mountain Desert. Mountain Desert? What is wrong with me? Mountain Desert Island Historical Society. And Todd Little Siebold. Is that yep. correct? From the College of the Atlantic. He's a history professor over there. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves um, and start off with their program. We're very excited to have everyone here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And to the library. And then I want to give a special thanks to the Blue Hill Historical Society for inviting us here tonight and for your program series this summer. I hope you guys have a chance to get involved with more of what the Blue Hill Historical Society is doing. I'm going to wear my mask because I am scheduled to go to Greenland in two weeks and I cannot go if I get COVID. So <laughs> forgive me. I hope that I articulate clearly enough, but it's really important for me to go to Greenland. So I'm going to keep that on. Um, so as um, Kaylee mentioned, my name is Rainy Bench. I'm the executive director for the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. I am a museum nerd through and through. I am a passionate believer that history matters. And I really spent my whole career working for very small history organizations and museums, mostly throughout New England, trying to find ways to connect history to our lives today to make it relevant and interesting and really learn from the ways that history has informed the things that are taking place around us today. So as we have a chance to talk tonight and Todd and I both will share our different ways of making history relevant and the work that we do. And I think that museums are uniquely poised to find this space for making history matter because we are a place that people seek out for entertainment, for education, and I'll go into a little bit more about sort of that relationship between history and sort of um, the general public, but I believe that public history is a really important venue for engaging people in local history, especially, but also as it connects to broader events. So I um, studied out in California. My master's, or my, sorry, my bachelor's degree is in Native American history, and my master's is in museum studies. So those are sort of the perspectives that I bring to this conversation tonight. But as I said, I worked in very small museums for my career. And then Todd will introduce himself when you when he has sure. his chance to yeah. um, share. But tonight we're really going to talk about the hows and the whys of what we choose to elevate as public historians and museums and the things that we do and how we go about doing that work. And I'm gonna get started because museums play a really, really important role in creating history education for the general public. And the reason that this is so important is because Maine is failing at it in their K through 12 education system. This study was released in 2001 by the Fordham Institute and it was ranking the quality of civic and history education in all the states in the country. And Maine has failing marks in both history and civics education. It's the resources that are created for teachers, the assessments for history, and also the availability of resources for students. And so not only are we failing in being able to provide this educational level for our K through 12 students, we don't have resources for teachers. We don't have guidance for teachers. And so 46 in the nation in history and civics education. So really, really terrible state of history in the state of Maine. So while it leaves teachers on their own and districts essentially on their own to figure out what to teach, how to teach it, the ways that they wanna communicate, the things that they prioritize, it also creates opportunities for really important history partners. So this scathing of history, as you can see, the strengths, there are none. There are no strengths in Maine's history and civics education curriculum for K through 12th grade schools. So while that's horrible, it gives museums and public history this really amazing opportunity to step into a void. Not only an, an opportunity, I would say an obligation, right? We have to be able to come in and become part of these conversations and offer resources. We need to be advocating for the importance of history and history education and history literacy in the general public. But we also have a great opportunity to be the ones in those spaces creating engagement for the communities, which is really exciting for me. 
And the reason that I get excited about it is because museums are uniquely skilled at being able to do this for a general public audience. We are professionals at taking super complicated, really interesting dynamic information and distilling it down into things that people can take with them where they are, sort of figure out how to take them to the next level of their learning experience and hopefully create a sense of curiosity and interest that will advance them into continuing to look into the subject on their own. So we're really good at that. And people seek out museums specifically for these experiences. They want to learn more about the place where they live, the place where they visit, the place where they love. And so we are able to create spaces for them to get that information, whether it's in history, natural history, arts, whatever that might be. We can create context. We can create a deeper sense of place and appreciation all through this work as interpreting history. This desire from our visitors to learn something new also creates an obligation to museums to give them something new. Not to repeat stated old history, urban legend, popular mythology, the things that everyone sort of associates or thinks about when they think about their community, but we know that people want something new from us. And so we need to give them new information. We need to push that boundary a little bit every time somebody comes to visit us. So that's part of our goal is to fill in those gaps in state education, meet people where they are and help inspire them to go to the next level in their experience. And so today, <laughs> I'm so sick of living in interesting times. <laughs> it's, it's not fun anymore. Um, Todd and I are going to talk a little bit about the ways that we go about doing this work and how we facilitate critical conversations today by linking things to the past. So um, if that gets too loud, we can shut that, but hopefully it won't be so bad. Um, and so, and how do we make history relevant in our communities? And so when we think about sort of the framework that I just created, that we have not just in Maine, but a failing history and civics literacy in this country, especially in this state, when we think about all the things that are happening today, it's so important, vitally important, that we create direct links from decisions, conversations, events, people that have taken place in the past to the things that are happening around us today. So we can make better decisions about the future that are in intelligent and purposeful, purpose-driven. So if you think about what would be different if we understood how democracy really functions in this country, the role of the states, the role of electors, Congress, the vice president and the courts, if everyone had a fundamental common understanding of those elements of our history, things might be different today. How would race relations and conversations about equity and justice be different today if we all had a common understanding of slavery, Jim Crow, the Great Migration, and the Civil Rights Act? COVID has surpassed the death rate from the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, despite the fact that we have access to vaccines that our ancestors did not. How can history help us understand the choices that were made in the past versus the choices that we're making today to be able to save lives. And then finally, what we're gonna talk about um, most in depth tonight is climate change, which is the most pressing issue facing humanity. And how can we um, participate in those conversations as museums? <clears throat> turn it over to you. Um, so my, my name is Todd Little Siebold. I'm a professor of history of College Atlantic. I'm the history department individually. We have 325 students. Um, I have one colleague who teaches art history part-time. So I'm responsible for all, the entire history curriculum, basically, um, that I think students need to know. Uh, when I saw the job description of the College of Atlantic, I said, these people are crazy. Nobody could do this job. Uh, but I applied anyway, and I, I got it. Um, and um, since then, have really had to think hard um, about how people approach history how my students approach history and how my community approaches history. I'm trained in colonial Latin American history. My specialty is uh, 17th and 18th century colonial Guatemalan race relations. I read census records and archival records from Sevilla and Spain to recreate the emergence of race relations um, prior to the idea of race. Um, 
That's what I was trained to do. And if I had not come to the College of the Atlantic, uh, that's what I'd be doing. Uh, somewhere, someplace in an academic institution, I would have just headed directly down that path as far and as fast as I could, published as many articles and books as I could on that topic, and seven people would have read the book. <laughs> it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I, you know, I can have a conversation in a room a third of this size with the people who really understand the scholarship that I do professionally. Um, one of the things that happened to me when I came to College Atlantic is I began to really work in the ways that Rainey was talking about, trying to think about what it is that students bring to the College of Atlantic, what they know about history, what they don't know about history, and what the bait was to get them to learn the history. Um, one of the things that some people in the room know that I do is I do the history of apples. Um, traditional apple varieties in Maine, I figured out like, oh my God, this is like the best treasure hunt ever. All I have to do to say is to my students, like, oh, well, let's go look for some apples. <laughs> and they said, well, what, what, what happened in this farm? I said, well, hmm, I wonder where we could find any records that might tell us who grew what on this farm. Like, oh, here's the US census records that have agricultural production for every farm in the state of Maine. Let's look and see what was grown here. So instead of teaching a, what I would have been doing somewhere else, a historical materials class, um, I had ways of helping my students have questions that they wanted to answer. Um, and then just said, oh, well, here's, here are the census records here. You know, here are the uh, property valuations books from the town of Northeast Harbor. Where you can look up and see what people own. And they're like, really? <laughs> um, so it forced me out of a sort of professional historian's idea of scholarly contribution to, which I still do, I still enjoy a great deal, to another conversation about students who were coming in with weaker and weaker historical background and a lack of curiosity because they had had terrible history education, most of them. And so they'd be like, I took an, I took an AP US history class. And I'm like, well, uh, Good, that's great. Um, what, you know, let's have a conversation about what you know. And what, had, what was happening was students were coming in with very, very simple ideas about how things work in the past. And that's where I came up eventually with this term of placeholder histories. They said, okay, what were the causes of the Civil War? The causes of the war were the conflict over the Union, blah, 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 states' rights, blah, blah, blah. blah. The answer to what the cause of the Civil War is, it's extremely complicated, right? And a student that cannot answer that in six and a half minutes on an AP US history, but they're taught that that is a sufficient answer. And I wanna point out something that's really important for everybody, and this is based on what Rainey's talking about to, to understand. Most people receive almost all of their historical uh, education in sixth grade, eighth grade, and 11th grade, three years, of placeholder histories. And one of the things that I would argue that has happened as a result of public education, conflicts over um, textbook publishing, is that we've ended up with a bunch of textbooks that basically provide really completely innocuous, simplistic answers that you can respond to a multiple test question on the AP US history, or even if you don't take AP, that you can quote unquote meet the standard. And so what happens in a place like Maine is the students will be forced to learn about Joshua Chamberlain, whether they're interested in Joshua Chamberlain or not, and maybe Molly Molasses if there's an indigenous uh, studies component for three days, and they're done. So one of the things that I think is incredibly important is all history is local. And one of the things that has been happening basically since the time I was in high school is you're taught, you just have to memorize a few things and answer the question. There's a right and a wrong answer about the causes of the Civil War. It's not complicated. You answer it, you get it right, and then you get a four or five on the AP, and then you know, off you go. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's simply not how history works, right? They're much more complex phenomena at work. Um, so, and I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit. So, this will be helpful, I think, in terms of some of the stuff that we're going to cover. My background is I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, on the edge of the city, uh, basically where this photograph was taken, um, in a place called Greenbone Gulch, uh, Greenbone Creek, um, up along the northern defenses of the city, way up in there. Um, and in my backyard, there were Civil War um, embattlements. 
So we could walk down to the local park and then people would be out there with metal detectors finding musket balls. I thought this was great. <laughs> we would go to Kennesaw Mountain, which was one of the only public parks around. It was a huge battle site. Um, and every year we went to, there was a, a diorama of the Battle of Atlanta that was part of our, our education. Um, and, um, you know, I literally, this is the historical marker that was right in front of my house. Um, that's, you know, talking about the movements. And the interesting thing about this part, this part of the history, for me, the great part was like, oh my God, the musket balls and all this sort of stuff. And I'd read this like, you know, oh, you know, the 19th, the federal 14th AC troops encountered determined opposition, blah, blah, blah. It's like, this is not written for me as a kid, mm -hmm. right? So I was like, oh, there's, like, that's, this Civil War thing is really interesting, but they're not answering the questions that I have. Um, and one of the things that I think um, is so interesting in terms of placeholder histories. So I grew up in Atlanta and I never knew that 40% of the city of Atlanta was burned to the ground by Union troops. Intentionally destroying the entire industrial center of the city, all of its commercial district and 20% um, 20, 20 roughly 20% of the inhabited areas of the city. That's what I call a sanitized history. Like you don't tell people about the history of the place that they live. And I'm gonna, we're gonna do just a little bit of back and forth today. Uh, two examples that I'm gonna give you um, that are about the sort of sanitized history of Down East Maine um, and the ways in which history is um, either forgotten or erased. And it doesn't really matter which when it's forgotten, it's gone, and therefore cannot inform how people live in their communities and act in their communities. Um, <clears throat> oh, and this is just another, this is an image of the downtown section of uh, Atlanta after the fire. So all out warfare used against American civilians in the Civil War, and uh, I have never seen that discussed in any textbook that's taught to kids. Um, and it'll turn out, as we see, that there's a link between all-out war against Native Americans, right, and the way in which um, all-out war is used by the U.S. government in different contexts at different times, which I think is a shared history that is important to understand and to know. Um, not because particularly uh, it's enlightening or inspiring, or anything, but it helps us really understand the role particularly of violence in the founding of our great nation. And that if you don't understand that, um, it's like not understanding the role of slavery or servitude or colonialism uh, in, the, in the communities that we um, inhabit. So um, Todd sort of took us to the South in slavery and the Civil War. And I'm gonna bring that up to the Northeast to our misunderstanding of our abolitionist New England past and how we don't have to really think about these things because New England was on the right side of this history. So I'm gonna give, as Todd said, we're gonna go back and forth a little bit. I'm gonna give a couple examples of the work that we've done at the MDI Historical Society. Museums have certain ways that we communicate information, exhibits being the most commonly recognized and understood, but certainly we have a lot of other ways that we communicate through public programs and education and outreach, um, and also through, as I said, pub publications is where I'm going to start with this one. So um, in 2015, I was asked by the Historical Society to write an article about the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the state of Maine which is not something I knew anything about at the time that Tim Garrity invited me to write the article. And it was a really amazing learning experience for me because there was an incredible rise of Klan activity in Maine in the 1920s. And as I said, I, I'm coming from California. And so moving to New England, I kept hearing that New England didn't need to worry about reckoning with its racial past because everybody here was an abolitionist. And so we have this long tradition, and so we're, we're all good here. But digging back into the newspapers, article, uh, newspaper articles, um, images, stories from different family members who are sharing things, journal entries, uh, all sorts of different archival materials and different collections throughout NDI, I was able to start to piece together a story that really 
said something quite different about Maine's history. And while the Ku Klux Klan activity in the state of Maine was not exertly or expressly directed at African Americans, it was no less active and um, prevalent. And in fact, at the height of membership of the KKK, which was in 1925, 23% of the state of Maine were members in the KKK. Over 100,000 people were members in this, the KKK in 1925. So, um, the different rallying activities related to the KKK were found a very neat home in the state of Maine because Maine had a long history of civic organizations or fraternal organizations that really the KKK started to sort of build their sort of second round. The KKK had three, we could say they're probably in their fourth influence right now. The first is, you know, right related to the Civil War. It's very directly um, violence related in the South, directed at African Americans. The second round of the KKK's activity is in the 1920s. And it's much more focused, especially in New England, on immigration. Anti-Catholic, anti-French, anti-Eastern European immigration coming into England, New England after World War I. And so, you'll see that they found this natural connection with fraternal organizations of membership, of rites and rituals, of symbols that they created, of these sort of rallying cries that today, if I told you the values that the KKK espoused in 1920, you will find that they are remarkably similar. And they're here around uh, this 1924 uh, banner, law enforcement. The KKK supports law enforcement. They support restricted immigration. They want organizational goodwill. They want a greater allegiance to the flag. They want to go back to the Constitution. That is ringing particularly true these last two weeks. They want better government. They want militant productivity. Part sorry, productivity. I can't say the word. <laughs> Thank you. Freedom from dissemination clean politics and better schools. So this KKK of the 1920s was not talking about what they didn't want. They were not trying to identify hate toward other groups. They were trying to say, this is what we want. This is what we are. By saying we want better schools, what it means is that we don't want Catholics in them. By saying we want cleaner politics, it's saying that we don't want immigrants. By saying that we want even the, the law enforcement and better schools relate to um, Irish and I'm not Irish, French Catholic immigrants coming in from Canada or who were already here, and that they were still speaking French in what was considered sort of American English speaking communities, that they wanted to use their own uh, cultural heritage um, celebrations, that they wanted to be able to use their own Bibles and stories and books to be able to continue those cultural traditions in the state of Maine. The KKK, while against that, was really much more saying what we're for. And then in, in, in saying what they're for, they're creating a sense of other. So these values are absolutely things that we still see referenced in the state of Maine today. So this rise of the KKK, while it was not as physically and overtly violent as you saw in other parts of the country, its popularity was also very brief. It really lasted only about a 10 year window of time, but it gained such an incredible foothold so fast that they were actually credited with being able to elect a governor who was a KKK supporter and sympathizer on the platform of anti-immigration, anti-Catholic and anti-French Canadian um, messages. So now you take all this, information from the 1920s and you fast forward to the last five or seven years and you see these same kinds of messages being targeted especially towards Somali immigrants in Maine with public displays of nooses, threatening flyers left in people's mailboxes, and a rise in reported hate crimes. And again, Mainers are using some of the same arguments for those actions based on what the Klan was using in the 20s. So with the rise of hate crimes in the state of Maine, we have increased scrutiny of our quote unquote abolitionist history. And so in 2015 is when I wrote the article that I'm referencing, but in 2020, this article gained a whole new uh, set of, of people who were really interested with it and wanted to learn more. So I had interviews coming from Canadian newspapers who were focused on the hate related to French Canadian and Catholic 
people uh, not only in Canada, but in the state of Maine. As we had um, Maine Calling and uh, Portland Press Herald did articles referencing this 2015 article. And then now when I actually looked at it just for this talk, there's a whole set of teaching guides that have been created on the article and um, references in, in addition to other material as well, but uh, being able to use this history and I actually gave us talk here at the Blue Hill Library in 2020 related to this history as well. So people started to make those connections over the last couple of years of this really incredible history of, of, of um, exclusion and, and understanding how we're excluding, excluding people in the state of Maine today. So it's really important to understand this. So hate doesn't get a foothold. Right, because it's so fast and it's so easy and it can start in these ways that you don't suspect or you don't recognize right away. And then it balloons really quickly. And then I just wanna, before I move on, acknowledge the fact that we have very aggressive ongoing up, um, oppression against our Wabanaki communities in the state of Maine. So we have a lack of understanding of sovereignty in the state of Maine. We don't understand the relationship between sovereign tribes, the federal government and the state government in the state of Maine. And what happens is you're asked to vote on those issues and you don't have, generally speaking, the information to make sound decisions on those votes. So this is where this history is super vitally important because the complex relationship between native nations, the state and federal government dictates the sovereignty of our neighbors within the state of Maine. Um, so to, one thing I should say is that um, Rainey's work and, and Tim's work on immigration and particularly the rise of eugenics, the sort of leadership of local people from MDI in the eugenics movement in the United States was, uh, or in, you know, generally um, really got me interested in, in ways of interpreting this history. Um, and so began to dig a little bit further. And this is actually one of my favorite um, sort of things that I found is imagine a clan clam bake. <laughs> okay, first off, like clever guys, whoever they were. It's all about marketing, um, right, Greg? <laughs> and, um, and one of the things that's really interesting about this is this is a farm, just a farm right in Trenton. Um, 5,000 people came to that. Basically, no, 5,000 people did not gather for anything in Hancock County in 1924. Four cents. Um, pardon? Four cents. Yeah, four cents. Um, and this, this the sort of along the lines of what Rainey was saying, right, 20, 23% of the population of the state of Maine were members of the Ku Klux Klux Klan, not just like supporters, but members. Um, and that these naturalization, um, I actually have a track down the grave, Graves Farm in Trenton, but it's quite easy to do. It's like, well, here's, here's where it was. Um, and this article actually goes through and talks about the naturalization of people into the clan empire. So you become a naturalized citizen of the clan. And it talks about the women's, uh, the women's auxiliary and you know, all these people. Um, there is essentially no person who was born in Hancock County um, who is in their 70s or 80s, right? Probably their 80s. Um, who did not have a father or uncle or grandfather or grandmother or aunt, or probably multiple of them, um, who were not at this event, right? And this is one of the things that I think when I talk about placeholder history, it's like, oh, that's great, we're all abolitionists. It's important to remember <laughs> that perhaps 10% of Mainers supported abolition. And those that did um, supported the expulsion of African-Americans uh, and their colonization in Africa. Mm -hmm. So racism was alive and well in Maine. Every, I mean, everybody loves to tell stories of the, under, the Underground Railroad. I'm telling you, baby, not very many people were taking those risks on behalf of other people. The slave trade in Maine, um, one of the things people, I always tell people like, oh, you've been to Faneuil Hall in Boston, there's this beautiful codfish on top of Faneuil Hall. What if that were a slave ship? Because the wealth of Boston, the wealth of, of uh, Belfast, of Portsmouth, um, were predicated on a slip ship building uh, economy and a triangle trade in which the last, some of the last people pr prosecuted for slave trading were from Maine. So built the ships, 
sold the slaves, profited from the cotton. Bath in the, in the Bath cotton mills, abolitionists were root, routinely um, attacked because the, where does the cotton for the Bath cotton mills coming from during the Civil War, coming from the United States South? So the implication of the American economy in these in these sorts of forms of racism is pervasive. Sixty percent of the economy of the United States was implicated in slavery in 1860. So people are like, oh yeah, that's that's down there, right? We were all abolitionists. It's absolute rubbish, post facto um, ways of creating um, a sanitized past. And I, one of the things that that I think is really important to remember is to think about is what. What does that add up to when we forget? This is Portland, Maine, 1926. And I was saying about, you know, anybody in their 60s or 70s, right? 80s in Maine. Um, there you go. Wearing a white hood, little American flag, and so one of the things that I think is extraordinary about these images, when I saw this one of, of Portland, I was like, wow, I want to go to Portland and, and show folks this, right? The first daytime rally of the Ku Klux Klan in America was in Maine. I don't know what that's about, but it's about something that people have swept under the rug. Okay, so... Now that we're talking about difficult uh, histories, here's your local history. One of the thing I sort of said, my local history, the, the, um, the um, history of Greenbone Gulch. So you guys are right up here. This is the Penobscot River, Castine, where the Indian houses, Monsignor, Castine's houses. I'm gonna tell you the story about this Indian fort on Walker Pond. Um, <clears throat> So in some point in the 17th or earliest 18th century, British militiamen from Boston came up to Archimagam, this town. Egamagan is named after this town, Archimagam, which is on Walker Pond, snuck up on it overnight and slaughtered every man, woman, and child. So this is the end of fort. You guys are right up here. Um, so I stumbled across this history. I was reading Donald Soctoma's sort of four volume history that he's collected of the Pasquapati people. Um, and I've, he, what he did is when he was tribal representative in, in Augusta, he collected everything he could about the Pasquapati and he just put them in these four spiral bound volumes sort of from start to finish. And the first one was called the Battle of Walker Pond. So, um, let me read you the account um, of the Battle of Walker Pond. Um, um, during, the, uh, during the time in the spring, you needed to uh, attack the whites um, so that there were fishermen who would come up and, and violate um, the Etchemin uh, Passamaquoddy uh, fishing areas. And so they attack these fishermen and, and kill them and, and burn their, um, their sloop, their little shallow. Um, an expedition was sent out from the Boston area with Colonel Church leading, landing near South Brooksville, where they captured an Indian who promised, was promised his life if he showed the village to them. He led them a long, difficult way, which kept them traveling all night. They came upon the village just at daybreak. It was a green corn time. The tribe had been having a feast and unsuspicious of danger, was sleeping late with no guards posted. The whites killed many of them. The site of the village is on a beautiful slope toward the southern shore of the lake, Evidence of the village is still plain to be seen. The soil is black from charcoal, many stone arrowheads and spearheads and other native implements. Um, then I found another account. So this says killed many of them. This is another account from um, Traditions and Records of Brooksville, Maine. Uh, punitive expedition was sent out, uh, same exact, basically the same language. Um, and it says the whites killed all of them except one brave who escaped. Um, and this is where I think local historical societies come in to play because it says, um, I have never seen an account of the battle in any local or general history, but the story has been handed down in the traditions of the old settlers and been, been verified by old men of the old town tribe of Indians 
who tradition agrees with that of the Weiss. It seems to me that this bit of local history should be preserved. Published in 1923 and disappears again, back into the, into the background. Um, so one of the things that I wanna point out is, um, so Maine, have you ever heard the term massacre used for violence used against Native Americans? Hmm. That's interesting. Because basically from 1697 until 1760, um, constantly violence was used against communities in which um, starting in the middle of particularly the, the early part of the 18th century, there was a bounty on the head of every man, woman, and child uh, in what were the, what became the Wabanaki nations. This is the Phipps, um, Oh, it's a terrible image, sorry. The Phipps uh, Proclamation, um, and I, I'm going to switch very quickly, um, in which basically the British government deputizes um, men to capture and kill and scalp uh, men, women, and children. And it says, for every male prisoner above the age of 12 years that, that, sh that shall be taken and brought to Boston, 50 pounds. <laughs> Roughly the cost of a farm, a small farm, 50 to, to 75 pounds, you could buy yourself a farm. For every male Indian scout bought in evidence of being killed, 40 pounds. For every ma female prisoner taken abroad aforesaid, or every male prisoner under the age of 12, 25 pounds. For every scalp of, of such Indi female Indian or male Indian under the age of 12 brought, to, brought as evidence of their... So this is quite interesting. The other word that is never used with regard to English settlers in southern, southern Maine or in Boston is bounty hunters. But almost every settler, every male settler in southern Maine participated in militias that engaged in this kind of activity. So think about that, that clan kid, right? Sitting there listening to whatever. But imagine the experience of basically growing up in a community in which um, routinely, people are being killed and scalped. And that is the history of the people who settled this area. Um, the bounty hunting was basically one of the reasons that Blue Hill was available to settlers. Because the Wabanaki could no longer defend themselves and their French allies could not provide them with the resources and, and eventually were beaten in the, what we call the French and Indian War, which is also referred to the um, as the Seven Years' War. The other thing um, that I think is quite interesting about this map, and I'll just show you to you again, um, is um, it says here, French inhabitants. French inhabitants. Um, and then also in Sullivan and Mount Desert Island, it says French inhabitants. One of the things that historical societies often have in their records is the record of the first white person born in their community. And by that, they mean white as in British, not French. There were French living in this area for almost a hundred years um, prior to settlement by the English. Um, these French actually were permitted to stay. They weren't expelled as the Acadians were. Lemoyne, um, Trenton also um, French lived there. But part of this is they were forced to basically incorporate themselves as Catholics into um, the Protestant communities that that came to surround them. And this is a map that from the um, Baring Bank in London, which is part of a collection associated with the Black House in Wood, uh, at Woodlawn, um, that shows the lands that um, John Black was responsible for trying to sell on behalf of the Baring Bank. And what's quite interesting here is in red on this map, it says French settlements right across Trenton and the eastern half of Mount Desert Island. Um, and what's interesting to me is I've never seen another map from the 18th century from Anglo-American uh, settlement of this area, which acknowledges the presence of the French. This is the only map I've ever seen. The other one is from 1734, prior to the finish, uh, the end of the um, French and Indian War. And one of the things that I think is so interesting to me and why I got so excited about this, this account of the Walker Pond massacre, not battle. There's no battle involved. It's called the Battle of Walker Pond. They killed every man, woman, and child. That's not a battle. 
And one of the things that I think is really interesting is the way that communities forget and then sanitize these histories so that people can feel good about that history. And I think it's time for us to really grapple with these complicated histories. Because by displacing racism to some other place, um, you know, one of the things that I was telling Rainey is in, um, in Haverhill, Massachusetts, there is today a, a monument of a woman named Hannah Dustin. And on that mon monument, she's holding 10 Indian scalps in her hand. There's also one on state land in New Hampshire, in Bosco in New Hampshire, where this happened. She was abducted um, during an Indian raid, her child was killed, and then she's sort of celebrated as a hero by Cotton Mather, who's sort of the patriarch of Massachusetts, for killing and scalping 10 Indians, six of whom were children. Um, and so people get all excited about monuments in other parts of the country, and I'm like, Kids, I don't know what I would be worried about in terms of monuments, whether it's a, a monument today, 2022, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, of a woman holding Indian scalps in her hand. So this displacement of uncomfortable or you know, uh, unseemly kinds of, of histories to other places, uh, I think is, it's time for us to get over that and start to really own these histories. The, the clan history, there was a cross burning at a church in Northeast Harbor at Christmas time as part of this clan. <laughs> it's like in Northeast Harbor. Um, and I think these histories really help us grapple with the more complicated background of our, our community's history. And then one of the things that I love about this, this sort of history is the archives can tell you, tell you how to proceed, what's happened in the past and what might be done. Thank you. So on that note, we are going to talk a little bit about the power of our collections to be able to tell these stories. And we're going to switch gear to climate change. So um, we're going to um, celebrate a little bit of partnership, <laughs> so a little less uh, intense. Yeah. Um, and, and be able to talk about ways that collections can empower not just information and an understanding of the things that are happening around us today, but also advocacy and ways to move forward in the future. And so um, when I took over as director for the Historical Society on Mount Desert Island from Tim Garrity in 2020, I inherited a project where we were going to um, publish a series of logbooks from Harvard students from 1880 to 1883. And I struggled with having written the KKK article and done a lot of this other history with why are we privileging these voices right now? And what is the point of this um, publication like, what is this so what? Why is this relevant to anybody in our communities today? And the log books are fascinating and they're wonderful and they're such an interesting collection. But it turns out they're also really, really meaningful and really important. And so asking that question of so what, why do these matter, led to this really amazing partnership, which we call Landscape of Change, in which we've invited together science, education, and advocacy partners with Skudik Institute, Acadia National Park, College of the Atlantic, um, A Climate to Thrive, and the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory and MDI Historical Society to look at historic records, pull scientific information and observations from those historic records, compare them to modern observations taking place on MDI now to be able to understand change over time and anticipate what's going to happen in the future. And so um, together, we are hoping to create a clearer picture of Mount Desert Island's natural environment and to be able to understand what is happening by creating benchmarks from the past to look at the present. And as I mentioned, we did these through a series of log books. And so our this amazing volunteer, Marie Fournier, went through and we have the, um, the records from this group of Harvard students. They were coming to M Mount Desert Island from 1880 to 1890. They called themselves the Champlain Society. Um, they were out here on the island camping every single summer. And they, were, they sort of mandated themselves to do something of merit, that they weren't just gonna tromp around in the summer and have a good time. They actually were gonna do meaningful work. And so what that meant to them was to go out onto the landscape and into the environment. And they took climate records every single day, recorded all the climate observations. They took sea water temperature. They took um, uh, specimens, bird specimens, and created a catalog of birds. 
They actually, in 1893, produced the first catalog of Mount Desert Island plants. So they did really meaningful work. They, in the summer, created these log books that we have at the collection of the Historical Society. And in the winter, they went back to Harvard and they wrote reports and they met and they shared their findings. And those records are still at the collections in Harvard. And so um, these really amazing detailed log books have all this incredible scientific information. And so in asking the question, is this useful? I'm really grateful to the creative thinking of our scientific partners, because as my dad, who's a plant pathologist, likes to point out, they're not, they don't meet the, to, to mo today's modern scientific rigor. They're not geolocated. They don't have, you know, MDI is 100 square miles. Like, does it really matter if the butterfly was seen here or in Northeast Harbor? Like, it's fine. So the scientists get that and they understand that while we're not going to get um, really great information that can be geolocated or we might have to be flexible on population density, the fact is this information matters and that they can use it. And so we spent uh, six or eight months pulling as much information as we could out of these logbooks. And we pursued four fields of study. We looked at climate, we looked at seawater temperature and sea level measurements, birds and pollinators as sort of the first um, opportunity to do that. So we pulled all this together and then we had College of the Atlantic students map it. And so while it was hard to find exactly the location of a bird or a pollinator specifically, we knew they were hiking in Northeast Harbor or they were on Door Mountain or whatever. And so we could get a pretty close proximity to where they were. So we took all of those historic observations and then we invited people last summer to go back out onto the landscape, especially inviting them to go to the places where the Champlain Society members were and take new observations. We wanted them to download these two apps, iNaturalist and eBird, and go out on the landscape and document what you find. So after a year of study and observation, not just pulling from citizen or community scientists last summer, but all sorts of records from eBird and iNaturalist, we were able to pull all this information together. And especially related to climate, the University of Maine and NOAA only had 100 years of climate data related to Mount Desert Island. We added 40 more years, which is pretty amazing. It's, a, it, it's an incredible lengthening of a data set. And then in addition to that, we were able to continue to do that work with birds and pollinators as well. And so we have real-time data now of species change, location, density, timing, and population health, thanks to this study. And we've had really amazing results as well. We've had a new way that we can inter interact with history on the landscape. So we're sharing the history of where these species were found, who was observing them, why your observations matter, because we're reading the observations of people 140 years ago. So your observations matter too. So this really different way of interacting with people related to history. We had a new appreciation of park policies, conservation policies. What was found with the plant study, not in our study, but there was one study done before us, which was plants, was in 1893, this catalog of plants was created. And in 2010, they were resurveyed. And it was discovered that one third of the plants present in 1893 were missing from the landscape of MDI in 2010. Some of that is the development of the park. There were huge meadows and farms and deforestation of MDI in the 1880s. Park preservation and conservation policies have created forestation. So any of those open field plants are gone purposefully, intentionally by conservation policy management, but not all of them. And so this project seeks to dig into the analysis of why things are changing. So what is the cause of change and how do we understand change and what do we want to control and what do we understand is not within our um, ability to control. We created a direct relationship between the importance of historic records and the landscape around you today and the understanding and the importance of observation and community science and engaging being part of a process and investing in solutions. But a lot of this speaks to people who already care. And that's where museums can be really important partners. I am not a scientist. So a lot of this, I like have a little imposter syndrome when I come up and talk about climate change. Mm -hmm. But I 
care and I'm a parent and I live on MDI and I want to be able to talk to people about it. And I want to be able to reach people who don't already know or care or have an invested interest. And so this last year, we invited Jennifer Steen Boer, who's a local artist, to go out onto the landscape and capture six, well, she chose six, but capture the way the climate is changing. And she's a photographer. So I sort of thought she'd go out and take pictures of drought and dying species and intertidal zones that are drying out or whatever. She didn't. She came up with these incredible illustrations that bring together historic record to create graphs that determine change. So salination or sea water, sea water temperature or influx of invasive species, the, um, this one related to the dive of the shrimp, shrimp populations and the invasive species of shrimp, oyster landings. Oysters are not native to the Gulf of Maine, they're farmed. But now with sea water temperature rises, we have natural wild forming oyster populations in certain parts of the bay. And so what does that mean for our um, saltwater communities? And so we created a series of banners that we have eight of these and we are now a museum without walls. We take them out to the island in various places where climate change is happening. And we put the banners up and we engage with people through the medium of art to evoke an emotional response to climate change where it's happening locally on MDI. And we have found that a lot of people did not recognize the science in the artwork. They understood it as graphically interesting or illustrative, but they didn't recognize immediately the science, which is what we want, right? Like we want to engage people in a totally different way. So we have done two of them so far. We have another one next week and throughout the summer, we'll be taking these all over the place to be able to try and engage with people to evoke that emotional response to um, the climate change issues that we face. And then finally, we also are creating results because history matters. So the first year of this study where we did pollinators, birds, uh, sea level, water, and climate, we just released the report. You can find it on Mount Desert Island Historical Society's website or the Skudik Institutes where Scudic scientists dug in to all of those huge data sets that we created and they created analysis. So they said, these bird populations are changing in these ways. So this species is on the rise, this species is declining, this species is new, this one is gone. We have all that information that they were able to collect and to be able to analyze. And as a result, this is now gaining national attention. We just won a Leadership in History Award from the Association for State and Local History. Thank you. Very excited about that. Um, and we've also are getting featured in a book and on radio shows because while scientists often use museum collections to be able to find really vital information, it's rare that the museum partners in the process of interpreting that information. And that's what we're doing. And that's what's so important to understanding local history. Climate change is huge and it's complex and it's intimidating and we don't always understand how we can be involved in it. But if it's understood in your backyard and you are referencing the changes that are happening that you can observe, it changes it. It all of a sudden makes it really real for you and it does create an emotional response. And the Climate to Thrive is our advocacy partner where they're taking this data and they're sharing it with the towns and the park and citizens to be able to say, some of this we can control. So we need resilient strategies that say, we don't want oyster landings or we don't want, I don't, they didn't say that, but <laughs> some things that we have control over. And then some are mitigation strategies where we are not gonna be able to control sea level rise, but we're an island. So it's really, really of a concern to us. So how that information is shared and what makes the town managers or the voters care is this piece that relate, relates specifically to local history. So I just wanna end on that sort of celebratory note that there's these really amazing ways that you can use your local history and the historical society collections to be able to empower yourselves to make really strong decisions moving forward. Right. Questions, comments, thoughts? I really quickly talk, follow up Todd on your conversation about the Walker Pond massacre. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a school teacher from Cedric, I don't know if she was Cedric or, or one of the surrounding communities who had heard that story yep. and wanted to know when the last Wabanaki people were in the community. 
yesterday. And I said, well, let's 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 <laughs> tell, let's start with they're still there. Right. <laughs> so that's the other part. I think important right. part of that of yep. that story of destruction is to recognize that. And there's actually really I had read a, a description by Bill Haviland about that same story, which he says there's a, there's a possibility that the the a native guide that they got actually took extra long and sent right. somebody ahead so mm -hmm. that in fact some of the people were able to escape before the English English arrived. But mm -hmm. it's it's really important to partner that story of devastation and destruction with the with survivors and persistence. Absolutely. Well, so even even there at Walker Pond, um, by the um, middle, well, by the time Blue Hill is settled, there's a native community there again. So people res respond, and this, and so where Herricks is on the far far uh, end of Walker Pond, there was a native community between the pond and Egmont Reach, even in the 1780s and 90s, living side by side with the English. And one of the things that I I did another talk for Sullivan Sorrento. One of the really interesting things that I that I think is fascinating to grapple with is the French seem to be able to live side by side. The English seemed not to be able to do that. And I think it's worth, you know, sort of problematizing, asking the question, like, why? I mean, there's a lot of different answers, but um, it's one of those great questions to ask locally, but yeah, absolutely. And the interesting thing, of course, right, is that by the time, and this is Modakawando, right? So when is, this is, this community is the same community that Castine, uh, Baron de San Castine is associated with, but absolutely, the persistence and, and return of many, Absolutely. Yep. Other questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah. My my impression from Colin Woodard, excuse me, my impression from reading Colin Woodard is that the English uh, and the French had different um, purposes in colonizing you know, where they did. And the French may have been less interested in the, more interested in making money and doing right. cotton supplies trading. Am I right about that? And then I think whereas the English were more relig religiously motivated, they had a sort of a, a, a <coughs> proselytizing attitude. Yeah. <coughs> so anybody who didn't conform to their yeah. religious bent was going to be in the way. Well, there's a, uh, so the, the, I would have to do another talk about that topic. <laughs> um, <coughs> so there is an argument that basically the English practiced anti-Catholic Catholic, uh, Catholic um, violence and othering in Ireland. They developed those techniques and the ways of treating people as other because of their um, because of their religious preferences in Ireland in colonizing and expelling the Irish from their own land. Mm -hmm. And that there was a pattern of that kind of behavior of the English basically from um, about 1620 onwards. Um, I think my own historical explanation is um, that the English were the worst at building collaborative relationships with native people. The French were best uh, among the Europeans and the natives were best because the natives had to work between the English and French uh, and essentially had to negotiate the borderlands between these two imperial rivals. And, and tribes, other tribes. Yeah. Well, and, and by the time, for example, we're talking about the 18th century, by the time that we're talking about the 18th century, the people who become the Penobscot are essentially war refugees from all of the wars in Southern uh, New England who have learned what it's like to live with the English. Um, and so this, this period when the Wabanaki are actually extremely powerful is basically from 1697 to 1760. They're able to use the French against the English effectively, but they also know the French are unreliable. Um, so they fight and then treat, and then they fight and they treat. They try to keep the English under, but what happens is every time they treat, the English will move across the line and violate the treaty boundaries. There's a famous example down um, on the Kennebec where after one of the treaties had been signed, the, um, the Wabanaki came down and gave, a, gave the owner of this house uh, flintlocks, uh, the flints for his flintlock. And they said, if you stay here, you're going to need these because you've crossed the treaty line. Mm -hmm. Right. And they had learned that the English would not respect their word. And that, I mean, I think would be a short history of English white relations. I mean, <laughs> so the English native state of Maine. 
Yeah. Yes. Well, I was about and to say, and I was, I was going to say, until uh, very even, I mean, and, I was and the Supreme, last week. <laughs> Supreme Court as well. Yeah. So, so I think, and, and I think that something like that, um, there's a great book called The Invasion Within um, by James Axtell that talks about the sort of religiosity, the way that religiosity and, and cultural conversion worked. And his argument is that the native people were best at converting Europeans to Native Americans. <laughs> the French were best at striking a balance with the, with the Indians and the Protestants were terrible at persuading because they, they, they would want to because the Protestant view was was so grim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a it's a wonderful book, very old, but I think incredibly persuasive. Um, and if you take somebody like um, Father Sebastian Raleigh, who li lived with Wabanaki at Norwich Walk for almost four decades and is scalped by the English. Right. Um, they send two expeditions against him and kill him and scalp him and take his Bible and his things back to the Harvard, to the Peabody Library. Um, yeah, it's pretty obvious they treated Catholics the same way they treated Native Americans. Um, and it's, I would point out, you could also say the same in Europe, right? <laughs> it wasn't a particularly pretty time in Europe as well, right? They were killing each other there as well. So. Yeah. I recently learned that there was a mandate, a legislated mandate in the state of Maine that all uh, schools in Maine need to have uh, Native American studies. Yes. And I learned that very few of them are actually doing that. Right. So the tribes, especially the Penobscot, have been really important education partners with the um, state of Maine to create uh, standards for every grade level. And then they had a series of teacher trainings where they were creating ambassadors who were trained in the content directly from the tribal members to go back and disseminate that information on the schools. The problem with teaching history in the state of Maine is it's not assessed. And so because there's no assessment, it gets pushed to the back over and over and over again to preference or privilege that like math and English and science where there are state assessments that kids have to pass. And so what is the reality is that, as Todd mentioned, history is taught at third, fifth, 11th, or whatever, and that's the same, the same is true for Wabanaki studies. It's looped in most of the time for that as well. And I'll be, I'll be really brutal about this. If um, they created that mandate and provided no funding. Correct. Right. Right. So it's or totally assessment. feel good legislation. Yeah. Right. The, um, the the Portland City of Portland School District um, just in the last several years has done a tremendous job of actually meeting the intent right. of the mandate. You, you know, yeah. Google, you know, well, I'm not going to say Portland Public Schools, and it's really amazing. Yeah. That took incredible persistence by a, a Portland school teacher and a Wabanaki yeah. partner, and you know, yeah. to make that happen. Yeah. Um, and it's and a play and a school department with resources and diversity and things like that that doesn't exist. Tim and then Max. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Todd, I know you teach a lot of students from an international yeah. background, and I wonder if you see a difference in the preparation of students from different parts of the world and American students. Um, <clears throat> uh, yes and no. I mean, obviously, you, we have students from all around the world, um, and um, I would say the... Um, this is going to sound terrible. Um, <laughs> the European students think they know history better than their American compatriots, but it is there's not a significant difference in their understanding. Mm -hmm. um, they are, because of the, the way that education is delivered in Europe, uh, they check the box. But um, I would say that most of them are not very sophisticated, nuanced thinkers. Um, what I would say, I mean, the other thing, I mean, you know this, but I'll say it out loud. You heard this, this so what's the name of the teacher of history at your high school? Coach? No. <laughs> right, because anybody can teach history. Yeah. So you recruit the coach and then you let them teach history, right? So I think that the, 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 the teaching of history is sort of, and how you engage kids rather than the sort of rote memorization I think one of the things that I, I would, would say, and what, you know, obviously I, I do this sort of very dramatic, like, Wah! you know, there's this massacre you should know about, you know, but then he's like, why don't I know about this? And why don't I have this question? And part of it is because we have these placeholder histories, mm -hmm. right? And I was saying, saying to Rainey, it's like, well, 
because the stories that we hear about Colonial Blue Hill are, you know, John and Fisher and people, you know, cooking in iron pots and making their own things and stuff like that. True, that was true. And they did that after they stole Native American land by using a, a form of violence that I think all of us would find repugnant. And we don't talk about that. And I think it's, uh, I think it's really, and there are some really great histories about how adept the Wabanaki were at basically figuring out what Europeans wanted and trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they do this for 150 years between two of the most powerful um, and, and repeated in the borderlands in Florida, in, among the Comanche. One book I would recommend to you if you're interested in Native American history is called The Comanche Empire um, by a guy named Pekka Hamelanian. More than you ever wanted to know about the Comanches. <laughs> but he basically says the Comanches were the empire in the central part of the North America, basically for the 17th and most of the 18th century, and finally lose control in the 18th century, that they set the terms. Um, and I think that briefly the Wabanaki, briefly and then, you know, for 150 years, they're able to negotiate this frontier. Um, land, so. Yeah, I think as part of like going to like elementary school or middle school. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, recently. Yeah. Um, recently, <laughs> <laughs> I wear that respectfully. Um, no, I saw you looking for that word <laughs> in the last decade ago. Um, especially in Maine, I went to school in DHCS uh -huh. uh, in Blue Hill, and then uh -huh. school up, um, at the Harvard School. Uh -huh. And there was there was no there was no education about Native Americans. Right. Um, there was I remember once we went to uh, the Abbey Museum in NDI, but that was in Right. Fifth grade, right. once. Yeah. Um, I definitely remember a lot. About, I probably taught um, you. <laughs> <laughs> that was you. That's probably me. <laughs> yeah, and so it's crazy. It was, and yep. it's sort of like I wish I could go back and like mm -hmm. ask my teachers for this sort mm -hmm. of for the the real the real stuff. And mm -hmm. also, just side comment: my fifth grade history teacher was actually a basketball coach. <laughs> one, one quick thing, one quick thing, if you want to know, particularly about Native American history, um, there's an excellent two volume history of Wabanaki in this area called Astakus Island Domain that was actually published by Acadia National Park. It is fantastic. It's the best single book of our local history with regard. To, they found they, there's a guy named Harold Prince, who is actually a historian of the Mi'kmaq or ethnographer of the Mi'kmaq. Unbelievable, and then his partner uh, Bunny McBride. Unbelievable, exhausted. You know, great history. Everything you weren't taught. I mean, that's I, I read it and I was like, wow, this is amazing history. What's it's free. Ask, it's called Astico, Astico's Island Domain, and it's online, free PDF, yeah. and is fantastic, well written, uh, and just comprehensive. And it's you know, it's all kinds of resources. So. Uh, do we have an online question? Yes, we have two. Okay, actually. great. Um, so the first one is from Donald, and it says, what does this suggest about today's racial climate? <laughs> After listening to you, should one conclude that Abraham Lincoln was correct when he warned that even with the end of slavery, yes. Blacks would never be accepted as equal to America? Yes. Well, not super question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does it say? So, <clears throat> uh, so I would argue that, um, that the abandonment of reconstruction, uh, the abandonment of equality during uh, the end of reconstruction really was the betrayal of, of any narrative that the war was about equality. Um, when national leaders decided that they didn't care about equality and that they were gonna walk away from reconstruction, it was really America saying, we don't care about equality. And um, the other part that I think, um, then it took almost a hundred years, right, for for activists to demand changes in voting rights. And we may see that um, reversing. And I think the arguments, uh, this is just directly to Donald, I mean, the arguments against racial equality at the end of reconstruction are exactly the ones that are being floated now about states' rights and the rights of states to, to set their electoral laws, for example, which are clearly discriminatory. Turns out that racism is democratic if 50.1% of the people are white and are racist, right? So I, I think that's um, really important. And I, but at the same time, I think the other question is, um, 
I would say that the Wabanaki have pushed questions of indigenous rights and sovereignty to the front of the, um, the front of the table for uh, white Mainers to take up and educate themselves about. Our state has done a terrible job of, of doing that. And I think it's up to citizens to demand that we recognize them as a tribal sovereign nation. But if you, you take one issue from this talk, from my perspective, to educate yourself, it's tribal sovereignty. Agreed. It's one of the least understood and yeah. known uh, aspects of we agreed, our democracy. We agreed to recognize yeah, tribal nations as sovereigns in their own right. And the state of Maine has just been terrible on this. Better under the Mills administration, no, but no, no, no but no, well, <laughs> then LePage. Uh, oh, well, absolutely. She just denied. Fair, fair enough. So yeah, uh, we want another. Even even question. the silver lining is gone. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have another question. I just have to ask you what you just said. Um, this one is from Leslie. This is in Woolworth, Connecticut. We try to remind students that they are living in the aftermath of native um, habitation. All the place names of state, city, roads, rivers, and are reminders of native languages and places. We name them and ask students to think of them. Um, a great New Yorker art to speak to this. So also not really a question. No, but I would just say like this is a thing that, that is coming out with the native land acknowledgments sometimes is that it's still a continuation of it can be still a continuation of colonialism like it's still the past we still acknowledge a past rare is the land acknowledgement that's given at the beginning of a speech or an organization referencing modern Wabanaki or in this situation or the relationship of sovereignty, you know? And so I think that while those were, those pieces are important, they risk being understood as nostalgic and not as understanding the political sovereign nation relationship. And so if you look at those and yet you elect people that actively deny sovereignty or don't fund Indian health services or Indian education or the different aspects of the treaty obligations that the federal government assumed in relationships with the tribes, then it means nothing. Yeah, and I, I would say one thing also about, about this in terms of why I raised sovereignty. Uh, obviously racial justice in, in a state like Maine is really important. We're the whitest Maine whitest state in the country, oldest state in the country. And one of the things is often people think that somehow that's like just happened, <laughs> right? Blacks were precluded from joining unions in Maine. So when the Great Migration took place, they came to Maine during this time when the Klan, you know, had 23% of the population as their members. And this, uh, you know, those that came were quickly uh, disabused to the idea that there was work here and they ended up in, in, in urban areas. Well, and also we had sundowner towns, yeah. which is not something that we understand is that if you weren't, if you were black and you were not out of the town by the time the sun set, you took your own life in your hands. So we have a long legacy of that in the state of Maine. In addition to the fact that there were no services, there were no hotels, there were no gas stations, there was no place that African-Americans could eat between crossing the border of Maine and I can't remember where the first one is, but it's quite a ways up. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's intentional, it's systematic, and it's part of the history here. You had, so you had a question? Um, I wanted to mention what this young man said. I also went to school in Bloomfield. Excellent. And um, things didn't change much when I was in graduate school. American studies program mm -hmm. had just become the thing. Mm -hmm. And I focused on American cultural studies. And towards the end of my degree, I realized there's nothing about Native Americans here. Like, what's going on? Right. Well, I had to go before a board to get permission to go <laughs> to either Yale or Northern Arizona University, <laughs> where the courses were well, offered, offered that I wanted and needed yeah. in my feeling yep. to complete this degree. Nice. And I was allowed to do Excellent. that. Good for you. But you had to push because it was like right. not even mentioned. Right. As was in high school, I loved history. I lived downstairs because we had no library. And if you behaved and had decent grades, you could come to the public library. So I owned the couch. <laughs> <laughs> and and, nice. and uh, consequently, 
I spent since I was 24 years old, much of my life south of the border. Mm. And we right. never knew that Mexico existed except for the Alamo right. or <laughs> Quebec, except or yeah. Canada, except for the right. plains yeah. of Abraham. I mean, yeah. that's how much we knew. Yep. Yep. And yeah. you had to read something like bark skins or something to find out a lot more. Yeah. 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 I'm curious about this primary source. I have a couple multi-part question. <laughs> My question is where are those from archives? What, what's the source of the massacre document? Yep. Um, my second question is, what do you think is the role of our community um, in uh, presenting this information? Yep. I wonder to what degree people understand this. Mm -hmm really fully except for here this evening mm -hmm. and so my question is also in addition what do the role of um what do the role of historical societies play mm -hmm. in um educating people and and we are i i would be remiss if i did not acknowledge the fact that we are in a library mm -hmm. right. and what is the role of libraries right. besides museums yeah in to educate people um, and what do you think, in your <laughs> estimation, is the place to, and it might be multiple places, in order, how do we present this information mm -hmm. so that the most amount of people, right. how is it best digested right. within local communities here, which I think is paramount, paramount as mm -hmm. well as externally, but how is that done? So libraries are better at it than museums, generally speaking, because libraries understand themselves. Well, first of all, librarians are like the most amazing people on the planet. So mm -hmm. they understand that. I'm talking about you. <laughs> oh, no, talking about you. Love you. <laughs> uh, they, they understand that their role is to be an advocate for information, not for a cause, but for information. And so they're really amazing at finding what is going on in the world or the community and connecting relevant information. Museums and historical societies that are doing their job well are doing the same thing, but to a lesser degree. And so I want to highlight and call out the Blue Hill Historical Society for wanting to come out and try to get these community conversations going. And we have between online and here 30 people listening to this talk. So what is next is that you now go out and you say, I have this great program that the Blue Hill Historical Society created. And you find those ways to let the society know, I'm interested. I will come to another one of these programs. I want to learn more. I want to be a part of it. I want to be some, in, in a situation that's different. And I think when I was president of Maine Archives and Museums for the, the state sort of nonprofit that helps support museums and archives is that, we heard from a lot of volunteer historical societies, especially we can't get volunteers and we just, we want more information about how to get volunteers. And we kept drilling into like, we just offered you like board sessions about how to get volunteers. Why do you need more? And we realized that they're not asking for volunteers. What they're saying is that we can't get them and why. And so we ended up doing a session called adapt or die, because if you don't adapt to what is happening in your community around you, and become responsive to it and find a way to be relevant, then do you deserve to be a nonprofit that gets public support? Do you deserve to have these spaces? I think that's, that's I mean, it's a, it's a tough question, but it's a valid one. Whereas if you can be part of your community's dialogue and understanding and evolution, if you don't wanna alienate people, but you wanna push them to those next sort of places of understanding and questions and resources that they want to look into more, then I think you, then that's what our role is. That's our job. And, and I, I want to jump in to, to so I'll, I'll be happy to give you the copies of these that I just brought. They're sort of my, one is from Donald Soctoma's four, four volume history that um, he sells through the Passamaquoddy Museum up in Indian Township, which is just great. It's like, a, it's a pile of everything he ever found. I mean, literally, not, just not like, all of which has its original source. Of I was about to say, which <laughs> is just like you found somebody's file folder. Some of it has its original sources. Some of it has oral histories, 
woven into it. It's, it's fantastic. And we can maybe make sure to connect the library so they can find a copy of that. It's really, really great. Um, and one of the things that I think is, is important is for communities to not shy away from the hard histories. Because, um, you know, it's, I always feel, I was telling Ray, I was like, you know, these are pretty intense histories, right? Yeah. Processing and thinking about them. But think about me, I am a professional historian. I read all the time. And I'm just sitting here flipping through this, you know, history of, of you know, past white people. And I said, Walker Pond, that's funny. There's a Walker Pond just down the road from where I live. <laughs> this couldn't be about our Walker Pond, could it? And I was like, Brooksville? I was like, yeah, Walker Pond. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, wow, like, how is that I don't know this, right? And obviously a lot of it is there's just a lot of things that have happened. But to hold up some of these more complicated histories, I mean, the, the, what, what Rainey was saying about anti-Catholic anti violence in Down East Maine, there's a 150 year history of that. They, they took John Baffs and literally tarred and feathered him and rode him out on a rail, you, you know, and um, because he wanted to open a school for Catholic kids. And I would just, I would add one, one last thing um, is that I think, um, Oh my God, I brain farted. What was I going to say? <laughs> I, I have that remember. effect on you. <laughs> I have that effect on um, I'll come back to it. I can't remember what it was. I think it's really interesting that Walker Pond is celebrated throughout historical societies for the ice, mm. right? Mm. I, I mean, that's all you hear. It's ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. All about the ice history. And under that ice is... Absolutely. Oh, that's, thank you. That actually references what I was going to say is that we hear all the time, especially now, that we want to go back to simpler times, right? Like, let's go take America back again. Let's go back. And we have this notion that things used to be easier. And I think it's because of placeholder history. We think that things are simple and the explanations are not very complicated. And then when you get in and you press into the details and you realize it's harder, I think we owe ourselves that now because it's super hard to live in this country right now. Like it's not easy to be here. And if we think that it used to be better, then we don't really empower ourselves to push through the pain and do the hard work to get things where we want them to be. And, and one other thing about placeholder histories that I wanna drive home, and this is incredibly, I think incredibly important. So let's take a massacre in which there's a calculated value on a human head, right? When do you introduce kids to that, mm -hmm. right? So if you're teaching them only like, you know, fifth and eighth and 11th grade, like that's when they get their history. When are they ready to, to, to reckon with the violence upon which our society is based? In Florida, never. Right. Well, that's what I was saying, because, you know, I, I have a 14 year old, I have a 19 year old, you know, and so, and they live around me, so they have to put up with a lot, right? <laughs> but there is definitely this, like, you know, where you, you really want to shield your kids from the horror um, of slavery, of this, of that, you know, you want to sort of, you want them to know about it, but you don't want them to know too much, because it is, it is awful. It's like witnessing, you know, the drunkenness of Noah, you'll be damned, right? And I think that we, as a society, have protected our kids, and then we become the adults who are protecting the next. And so there's never an honest reckoning. Um, and then we start to argue about you know, critical race theory and all this sort of stuff, because people are unaccustomed to hearing the actual histories. Right? Yeah. yeah a couple of quick comments. One is, mentioned it earlier today. Most people don't know the damn thing, for example, about the 14th Amendment and, <laughs> and the creation of the 14th yeah. Amendment right after the Civil War and have so much of what we're experiencing right now going back to states' rights, et cetera. Yeah. Need, and you, yeah. People got to learn that and they just don't know. Right. The other thing I, I, I'm wondering about in terms of your uh, presentation, what about the issue of uh, media in terms of Video. I mean, there are all sorts of interesting videos, American Experience, and beyond that. And my only feeling is, and I've studied this stuff and, and, and taught it for years, but is that it's not well integrated in ways that get the public involved sure. actively. So, sure. So, which is what you're talking about, little communities. Sure. You know, and 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 then even 
integrate it with local research issues. Sure. Yeah. So you can have more and more. I'm not saying the public's going to come out and mass numbers to do research and be involved, but you get more, you could get more people if the yeah, historical society beyond had more, you know, museum and, and high schools would have more interesting forums and other things like that, where a lot of these things are discussed with media and keep yeah. a dialogue going. Well, I think, I think just to respond, one thing that I think is really important, um, and this, I think I learned this by hard, hard, you know, hard reflection. Um, people have to have that question, right? And if you have these placeholders histories that sort of keep in the way, oh, the war, you know, civil war was about, you know, freedom and justice and people from Maine, you know, Tim can probably tell you this, but like 60% of, of Maine civil war uh, veterans were drafted. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> right. Something like that. So they weren't like freedom of justice. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, you are going to war, young man. Right. And if you weren't wealthy enough to pay to have somebody else go, you were going to war. Mm -hmm. And so there's also, you know, the, you know, the heroic, you know, Maine boys, 60% of whom were reluctant to go to war. And I would say, except for maybe a very few abolitionists, none went to war for equality for African Americans. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a great book by Ira Berlin called The Long Emancipation, little tiny book, great, great to read, short, and he basically says the only people in America who've advocated for African American equality are African Americans, until the 1960s and 70s, and even then he says, you know, true equality, and that's, that's 14th Amendment, people passed it, and then they said, yeah, forget it. Right. I, would, I would suggest in terms of thinking about media, though, that and, and the, I've been to a program yes. here that the library hosted by Maine Wabanaki Reach. Um, Maine Wabanaki Reach is an incredible resource when it comes to learning about sovereignty, but also Don, um, Upstander Productions, their film Bounty. So there's actually a film about the Fifth Proclamation and about that bounty. Oh, cool. It's okay. short. It's like, I think it's like 15 minutes or less, but it, so, so yeah, so, the, so that, that material is being created. Upstander has created, they've got um, Don Land, they have um, the full length film about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then there, again, the most recent project with Bounty, which has Penobscot people reading the Fifth Proclamation and reflecting on what it means to them and their Penobscot bodies and so on. So um, there are the resources are out there. And again, Maine Wabanaki Reach is a really great way to take to work with that history and say, what does it mean today? I think we have time for maybe one more and then Greg, I'll let you maybe wrap it up from the perspective of the historical society. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I would propose that um, the teaching of primary sources is a fundamental issue mm. for teachers mm -hmm. and that if schools could bring children starting at a younger age into libraries, into archives and actually show them the importance of primary sources because that's often taught at the college level, right? right? Yeah. But it is not often taught enough at the primary middle school level. Yeah. Once children understand how to find information yeah. Yeah. And, and understand how critical it is to read primary sources yeah. and judge for themselves, I think that that will make a huge a leap in terms of communities and yeah. you know the country as a whole. And, in, yeah. in 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 actually uh, uh, digesting yep. the importance of history. Well, that's why I think digitization of collections is so important because it's not realistic that kids can always have access to the direct document itself, but scan digital copies that they can access in their classrooms and become yeah critical thinkers as they digest this information. Is, I mean, in I Massachusetts, agree. we take kids. Right. take college kids into archives mm -hmm. yep. you can do it it's yep. it's possible right and being in situ yep. is a really really yes. valuable thing yeah. yeah one one thing that that i know rainy and i've been talking a little bit about at woodlawn you know and i know at mbi historical um we, so at woodlawn we're creating a new center event center and research center called uh, part of it's called the center for down east history and one of our missions is basically to create, um, we do uh, house tours for, the, for, for kids about anywhere from 600 to 1,000 kids a year. And the idea is to have hands-on with material objects and hands-on with archives, um, and then also help them generate their own questions. Because I think that's the other thing 
is to say, so, you know, in this archive, what are, what can we help? I mean, this is what you were saying about libraries. What can we help you find? What can you, what are you interested in? Um, and I think that that I know is one of the things that's happening with historical societies, museums, places like Woodlawn, that's the way that we need to serve the public now is, is different. And I think all of us are grappling with what that means and how we engage them. Um, and, you know, I was just talking with our executive director about sort of a, a hard histories series, because I think people are hungry for these kinds of conversations. When I taught at the University of Miami, sorry about it in the end, yeah. but I, I got a project going uh, because there was no documentary history of, of Miami, big city, important city, et cetera. It was all sorts of discord. Yeah. So we got a project going that in fact, involved all sorts of students and they we got a book published out of it all primary documents with little summaries ran it thematically mm -hmm. uh pulled together was themes throughout american history so it was taught in, in yep. u.s history courses but local essentially history the state of maine should do something like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know. maybe give you the last Chris, question yeah, Chris, yeah, yeah that's just a very quick observation clearly in what you presented and said tonight we have a problem with policy all the way from mm -hmm. local school boards right up to the yeah. federal government. Yeah. We also have a problem, I think, with the textbook publishing companies. Right. Yes. When are they going to get, get right. the religion yeah. and, and to, to help turn this around? Yeah. yeah, that's a good point, Chris. Yep. Yeah. Greg, do you want to <coughs> say about, do you have a next program or things you want to promote for the Blue Hill Historical Society? Um, yeah, yeah, well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we do have a program coming up on August 14th, in relation to, uh, just show you these and pick them up here, to the um, Maritime Heritage Festival. So Kevin Johnson speaking on um, images of the Blue Hill Peninsula over time from the Penobscot uh, Marine Museum. And it should be really fascinating, really good speaker. Sure. And uh, we're going to have another talk in July, but it's not settled yet. And then I have couple other that we, we've talked about in organizing, one in, real, in, in conjunction with the Congo Church and what happened to the authority of the Puritan parson since uh, Jonathan Fisher's day. Um, trying to bring in maybe an outside speaker for that. Mm -hmm. And um, another one I've started to work on with some others, um, and that is looking at public planning or planning for public spaces in Blue Hill over time. Mm -hmm. Which I think will be really interesting in, in many ways and get us to learn a little bit more about our own approach in the past. Mm -hmm. And how can people find that information and stay up to date with the Blue Hill Historical Society? She's good at this. Like I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Blue Hill <laughs> Historical Society. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, thank you guys. Okay.